You bet. I Is Jerry giving you orders? The Columbus Metropolitan Club was founded in 1976 by 13 women leaders who wanted to be included in the community conversation. I am Sally Bloomfield and I was one of those 13 women. Having been left out of men's clubs that focused on community issues, it was a priority for us to make the club 100% inclusive. Today, CMC presents public policy forums every Wednesday at lunch with average attendance of more than 200 people. I'm Tony Bell and I frequently attend forums which are open to everyone and present relevant, current and newsworthy topics. I'm grateful that CMC is nonpartisan and presents many perspectives on every topic. I'm Jane Scott, President and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. CMC is open to everyone. We invite you to explore the personal and professional benefits awaiting you at the Metropolitan Club. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you today to CMC's annual Lynn Greer Legacy and Civic Engagement Forum, celebrating inclusion and equity for the LGBTQ community. I'm Tom Daly. I'm the area developer for Zoop, uh, Tasty Dog, and also the chair of the Tom Daly Foundation and a member of the COSI board. Uh, and I'm also a member of this uh, community, the LGBTQ plus community. So I'm especially honored to be the moderator, uh, not the moderator, the uh, presiding officer for today. So let's begin by uh, meeting our newest CMC members at the meeting today. We have Lourdes Barroso de Padilla. I hope I said that correctly. <laughs> With, with City Year, Curtis Davis with ICS, True FM, and the Diversity Chamber. Curtis. <laughs> Manana Fribley, I hope I'm saying that correctly, with Middletown Motel Management. <laughs> Welcome, Manana. <laughs> Tracy Holacek with Kaiser Consulting. Hope I got that right. Thank you, Tracy. Ro Robert Young with RCY Medicine and Rena Sims with AARP Ohio. Welcome to all of you to CMC. We also invite your organization to become a CMC sponsor. Half of our annual revenue comes from the generous sponsors you'll find in your forum flyers. Please see Jane Scott or Lainey, uh, Lainey, I can never say her name right, Cuthbert, <laughs> becoming a sponsor. So Jane and Lainey here, Jane is here, and Lainey, where are you? Oh, okay, great, thanks. So please see Jane or Laney when you're, um, if you're interested in being a sponsor, we very much appreciate it. Uh, we'd also like to thank today's forum sponsors, AARP Ohio and Ulmer and Byrne uh, firm. Let's thank them. 
and very grateful today's forum partner for not only for being a partner, but for the great work they do, PFLAG Columbus. Thank you, PFLAG. Today's CMC live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. I'd also like to share a few comments from our sponsor, AARP Ohio. Uh, AARP Ohio works to enhance the quality of life for all of us as we age. They have an unwavering commitment to the LGBTQ plus community that reflects a core belief in dignity, worth, and potential of every individual. With approximately 900,000 of nearly 38 members uh, self-identify, 38 million members self-identifying as LGBTQ+, AARP has one of the largest LGBTQ+, constituencies of any membership organization. Through its policy work at the community, state, and national levels as an employer, and through its work with others serving multicultural communities, AARP Ohio drives awareness and understanding of the needs and challenges facing the LGBTQ plus community as they age. For more information, please contact AARP Ohio or visit aarp.org slash pride uh, for more details. And now on behalf of AARP, it's my privilege to introduce today's panels. Founded 40 years ago to increase the visibility and acceptance of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community, Stonewall Columbus turns 40 this year. Today we'll explore the last 40 years and hear what the future holds for Central Ohio's LGBTQ plus community. Please welcome today's speakers. Leanne Masucci, owner and principal of the Masucci Law Group. Leanne. Denzel Porteous, Executive Director of Stonewall Columbus. <laughs> Jose Rodriguez, Director of Community Relations for Equitas Health. <laughs> and please join me in welcoming our host, Megan Kilgore, City Auditor with the City of Columbus. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to be here with you today. Absolutely an honor. And this forum, of course, is named after Lynn Greer. Lynn is the founder of the National LGBTQ Plus organization, the Victory Fund. She is a, an absolute civil rights pioneer, and she's one of my dear friends. I even brought a little piece of Lynn with me today. And this is true Lynn fashion. So let me explain. I, a couple, about uh, three four years ago, I come home from a business trip, and there's this weird package sitting on my doorstep. Now, there's no return envelope. I am in an office now, and I'm like, well, what is this? This is odd. I, I pick it up. It's pretty heavy. Again, no return address. I open it up, and this bag is within it. And this bag happened to be the bag that Lynn Greer carried for a majority of her career. Now, it's a beautiful Kohan bag. It has a lot of years still left on it. But the note that she wrote, the note that she wrote said, I've carried this bag on the steps of Capitol Hill. I've carried it in local courthouses. I've carried it in bars, and I've carried it in restaurants, and I've carried it to anyone's office who would listen to me about the importance of equality. And I have worked my entire life and have given of my money and given of my time to try and elect people like you. Please carry it forward, and please continue to remember the hard work. A lot of people are, are feeling that right now, and I, I cried that evening. I mean, it was, it, was, it was deeply, deeply, deeply important to me to understand. And so um, I brought it today as a piece of good luck. Um, this may be a little bit of a gay passing of the torch, if you will. Um, but I, uh, I I'd carry her legacy every day, and, I, and certainly in my role as the city auditor. Uh, today we are celebrating the contributions of Lynn, but also the amazing work of Stonewall and to recognize its 40th year. Stonewall, huge organization, 15,000 LGBTQ plus persons uh, and allied community members in the central Ohio region. It serves, that's massive. And it was founded in 81 to fight for tolerance, acceptance, and basic human rights. Today, its mission is to increase visibility, inclusion, and connection for the LGBTQ community. Stonewall's physical home is, of course, on the center on high, 
a community center for all, but Stonewall truly resides in the hearts of all of us here on stage and countless others whose lives have been changed for the better because of its, because of its existence. Today's panel, we're gonna focus on the 40-year impact of this amazing organization, and we are joined today uh, to my left by representatives of its past, present, and certainly its future. As your moderator, I'm gonna be completely honest. When I was first asked, I was entirely intimidated by the topics. I can talk to you for hours about the economy. I can talk to you hours for about a lot of things. But to honor the service and, and, the, and, the, and the work of 40 years of what Stonewall has meant was daunting. It really, really was. Um, in preparation, I made a lot of phone calls. I talked to a lot of the founders. I talked to a lot of the individuals who, through their kind of blood, sweat, and tears, figured out how to make Stonewall what it is today. Um, Lynn was obviously a very important part of those conversations. Craig Huffman, Steve Schellebarger, MJ Hudson, Sue Pyle, um, thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for your honesty and for opening up to me. Um, that was uh, really, really important for, for, for me personally as well. And certainly all of them had very wonderful things to say about the speakers to my left. So I think uh, let's go ahead and get started. Julie Dore Andrews is always right. It's best to start at the beginning. So I'm going to start with, well, let me tell you this. One of the people I spoke with, MJ Hudson, Mary Jo said about this individual, his courage is unparalleled. And so I pose this first question to the first trailblazer on this stage, Jose Rodriguez, to kick us off, uh, since you were there, sir. And so my first question, Jose, tell us about Stonewall in 1981. What did it mean to you? So I wasn't around in 1981. Um, so I'm old, but not that old. But I can tell you about the 1990s. So um, I came to Stonewall um, when Gloria J.T. Smith, and some of you may remember Gloria. I see Carol shaking her head. Um, Gloria was the executive director for the Columbus Hates Task Force. And Gloria was a trailblazer. If you can think of anybody as a trailblazer, Gloria was that. Gloria was on the board of Stonewall, and as she was exiting the board of Stonewall, she called me and she said, would you be um, willing to serve on the board? And I said, of course I would. I was then on the board of the Columbus Hates Task Force as well. And nothing could have pre prepared me for the work of Stonewall in those days. And I have a lot of notes because I made a call to my friend Phil Martin, who was the fifth executive director for, Phil's my neighbor too, but he's summering in Maine. That's another story. Um, Anyhow, and Phil reminded me of all the important work that, that Stonewall did. During those days, Megan, I was also working with my friend Leanne Masucci um, um, on a project that Lynn Greer, it was her vision of working with policy makers um, to, to help reach equality, and, and that was a real pleasure. I see Commissioner Brown here, Commissioner Brown. Without people like you, we would not be sitting on this panel today. The importance, yes. <clears throat> the importance of policy makers is, has been critical to our progress. So I just want to analyze. So not only people like you, Megan, but also allies to the community. We could not be here today if it wasn't for, for all of you. I appreciate that. During these interviews, um, there was a, a statement from, I believe it was Craig, who said um, Jerry Hammond saved his life? You know, um, I see a lot of nodding heads, but Jerry Hammond, of course, was an extremely important figure in the in the right place, at the right time on city council, and he was a champion of LGBT rights. And um, in his legacy, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, Leanne, tell us about your initial involvement, and you have really an interesting career, a lot of different iterations. Talk us through that. Well, first, thank you for asking me to be here, folks. I'm honored to be here. Um, I was first introduced to Stonewall through Lynn, of course. Um, and it all, she only needs one name, right? It's like Cher and Madonna. Like it's like Lynn. Um, Lynn, I met Lynn when I was coaching at OSU through a mutual friend. And at that time, coaching at OSU, all I was trying to do was stay under the radar. Okay, I was not advocating for anything or anyone. 
other than my athletes. Uh, and Lynn, you know, you, you can't do that around Lynn. You can't do that when you know Lynn. So she got me involved with, uh, with Stonewall, uh, talked to the executive director at the time who was Jeff Redfield, who I see here. Um, and and it, was a, it, it was a complete eye-opening experience. Um, I, you have to understand, I grew up in a small town in northeastern Ohio with 6,000 people. My parents were hardworking. They stayed under the radar also. I went to school at the University of Alabama. I was a Roman Catholic lesbian athlete, okay? <laughs> that didn't work very well uh, in general. But when I, you know, so when Lynn was, you know, Lynn is just a bundle of energy. You have to do this, you have to do that. And, and so I followed her lead. I was very impressed by her. I was in awe of her. Uh, I respected her greatly, and so when she said, let's try to do this, let's be on the board, let's do this, let's, let's try to start an organization that, that Tom and Jose and Mary Jo, we were the first iteration of Equality Ohio, and that was one of the most proud things I had done at that time. Um, and Equality Ohio was an interesting organization because we actually got and encouraged and required uh, policy makers and elected officials to pay us to support them. Now try and picture this. We did Equality Ohio. We had these wonderful napkins. I think I told you this story. We had these great napkins, bar napkins. I owned a, I'll get to the bar part. But <laughs> we, we had these, these great bar napkins that had an outline, a red outline of the state of Ohio, and the names of, our, uh, of the, those folks we sponsored in their respective seat, in their respective cities, and, and in red with a big star, and then we put those out in every bar and restaurant that would allow us to do so, and basically said to folks, "These are our folks who support our community. These are like-minded individuals who we need in a, in our corner." So that was that was an a very that was a very extraordinary experience, and and one as I said, was, was a very, a, a very much a learning experience. Through all of that, I was still at Ohio State coaching. Um, and it was right at the time, many of you know, it became very difficult for women coaches who may or may not have been lesbians, okay? And they just started picking them off, one by one. As luck or misfortune or however, I, irony, I was in a situation where I had developed a very significant joint issue that made it very difficult for me to stay on the court. I was the tennis coach. I was a tennis coach for 13 years. It made it very difficult for me to stay on the court. I was thinking of how am I going to make this transition. That was my career, but I knew I was on the chopping block. Um, so as it turned out, I re was able to retire uh, from OSU on uh, my occupational disability. Uh, and, and so it was a graceful way for them to kind of sweep me aside, and it was fortunate for me. Um, at that time, I owned a bar called the Clubhouse Cafe that I had bought um, from Tom and his partner at the time, and it was under, my wife and I purchased this. OSU wasn't real crazy about that either. Um, <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was a great place. It, 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 was, a, it was a special, Special. It was a safe place for folks. They could come. It was, it was relatively dim lit. It was a coffee house bar. If you weren't a drinker, you could still come and you could have wonderful coffee. And we had a movie theater in it and we had a living room and a dining room. And it was a place where we held so many fundraisers, so many fundraisers for Stonewall, for the AIDS task force. I mean, after the the marches every year would end in our parking lot and we would have pools, you know, kiddie pools where you could come and you could rest, you put your feet in. Um, but that was a, it was really a wonderful experience to have people come and feel welcome and wanted and safe. Uh, it didn't matter if you were uh, a male assigned at birth who was dressed in female clothing. And that was big at the Clubhouse Cafe. But it didn't matter. We didn't care, and we just welcomed everyone. We had lots of straight allies. 
it was a beautiful experience, and I thank Tom for giving us, giving Lori and I that opportunity. You might remember David's on Maine. It was prior to out on Maine, um, and that's who I bought the bar from was David, and uh, we we. It was just a wonderful experience, so that we sold that so I could go to law school because I felt through that experience that there was more ways in which I could help our community. And Mary Jo Hudson being an attorney and, and also being one of my mentors, um, and my wife got tired of listening to me say I want to go to law school. Um, she said, you're going to be 42 whether you go now or not. <laughs> and so at 39 I went to law school and here I am, so thank you. I want to circle back on the role the built environment has played and where the, the especially the bars, the locations have played in this, this advocacy movement. Um, but Denzel, to round out, first of all, happy birthday. Yesterday was your birthday. And I, you've had also a lot of building blocks in your career that have prepared you for your present post of leadership. Talk us through that and, and what made you say yes to Stonewall? <laughs> uh, thank you. And first, uh, thank you all so much for this uh, wonderful opportunity to spend a little time reflecting on 40 years of what Stonewall has done in the community um, and hopefully for 40 plus more years of what we will continue to do in the community. Um, I am grateful to, to serve as executive director uh, in this current time and moment, um, a tumultuous time in our community's history uh, here at home but across the country. Um, and I think, if nothing more, uh, they say that someone serves at the right time for the right moment. I do believe this is the right time for me to be here. Um, I represent such an intersectional uh, part of our community, of our story, of our history, of our future. And, and I think saying yes to Stonewall was easy. Um, it's hopefully uh, getting the rest of the community to understand the importance of, of the work that we do and why we are so importantly needed here. Um, I originally was born in Jamaica, West Indies. Um, to a single mother who had three older kids before me. Um, and we moved to America in the early 80s for you know, that, that vision and belief of uh, gold streets um, and wonderful opportunity. Um, my mother never graduated from high school. Uh, so one of the first things that I can remember in my experience was going to uh, community college and watching my mom complete her high school degree, sitting in the back of the classroom and watching that. Um, seeing how she struggled to, to uh, achieve an American dream uh, my mother also passed away um, when I was 14 years old from HIV AIDS complications. Um, uh, an epidemic, a pandemic uh, that was only, a, of course, affecting the gay community, or so they said. Um, and so uh, there I was uh, at 14, 15 years old trying to understand where I fit into the world, um, understanding my own sexuality, my identity, uh, who I was, um, but had to do so uh, without a mother, uh, with no father in, in sight. Um, and I think if nothing more, um, what I had to turn to at that point in time, uh, there was no internet, or like no real internet anyway, darn it, Al Gore. Um, <laughs> there was no internet at that point in time. Uh, but what I had to turn to, you know, were pamphlets and movies and, and, and what you saw um, were pictures of, of LGBTQ queer folks not being accepted in, in, in spaces. Um, uh, I was growing up in New York at the time. Um, after my mother passed away, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, um, where uh, it was not a haven for gay folks. I, I wouldn't say it still is today. Um, but I moved into a home with my aunt and uncle who um, were able to open doors and opportunities for me and understanding that I hadn't before. Um, to help me understand who I was as a queer person, um, as an LGBTQ person. And while I hadn't come out to them until I, I was a senior in high school, um, they made the resources available to me. Um, they gave me the space to find out who I was um, and then to explore that opportunity. Um, and through that, I became familiar with an organization called Advocates for Youth. Um, Advocates for Youth is an adolescent sexual health reproductive organization that really focused on empowering young people to understand that they have power and they have rights. Um, and it was through that experience that I realized that I could use my voice to help other people uh, along their journey. And so I here I am, you know, fast forward many years later, now celebrating my 41st uh, year around, uh, and, and I think what, uh, what has come to me in this particular moment is um, that reminder that all I wanna do is be happy. My mother moved to America um, for that belief so that I could find my happiness. Um, and my happiness is being an intersectional person, which is being gay, which is queer, which is black, which is Caribbean, which is Jewish, which is a father as of last year. Um, which is being a partner to my wonderful uh, husband over there, or soon-to-be husband, 
um, it, it and is living out as a, as a black man in all of those spaces. And I think what we have as an opportunity in Stonewall and what has come before me um, have been fighters who just wanted to be happy. Um, people who just wanted other people to be happy as well. And I think for the next 40 years uh, of our organization's history, we'll continue to fight for people's happiness. Um, and that is to be seen, to thrive, and to be uplifted. That's a, a spectacular uh, response. You know, I think um, during the span of Stonewall's 40-year existence, the city of Columbus has clearly evolved from a place where the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community has had to live in secrecy to now one of the most LGBTQ plus friendly cities in the entire country. I think the best way to illustrate that change is through the evolution of our advocacy. And, you know, I talking through these, um, uh, these interviews and hearing Leanne talk about napkins, <laughs> we've clearly gone from putting flyers on cars at two and three in the morning to having to advocate via napkins in bars and restaurants, secret conversations with elected officials, and cash only. That's something that is, is, is very clear. Everything was cash, because cash you couldn't trace. You couldn't see who the folks were who were supporting the LGBTQ causes. Craig said, uh, Craig Huffman, one of the founders of Stonewall, told me, we did not know to be afraid. And he also, you know, talked about um, the, f you know, really all that there could be to fear, especially in the 80s. But he just said we were young and we were impassioned and we didn't, we did not want to focus on that fear. And so I want to ask maybe Jose to kind of reflect on that, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you, Megan. And um, the, the one story that I can tell you that I that I can think back of, and and he talks about resiliency, and it it almost feels weird that. that it meant so much in the 90s, but it was a, a project that came out of the board. It was, we called it then the Banner Project. And that meant putting banners on High Street and Broad Street that would have a gay flag. Not much else, but a gay flag. I cannot tell you the impact that that had on the community in the 90s. I mean, nowadays, we can all drive our cars with a gay flag if we want to. I have straight allies that do that. But in the 90s, to put gay flags up and down High Street, and, um, our vision for that was we are part of the infrastructure of the city. So why not make it visible and let everybody know that comes to Columbus that we do have a stone wall and that we do pay taxes and that we own property and, and we contribute to the wellness of this community. I have a background in public health, so wellness is, is big on my, in my world as well. But I remember that Saturday morning, so the Columbus Convention Bureau, the predecessor to Experience Columbus, <clears throat> allowed us to buy the flags. Tom Grody's mother, Annie Ames, Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Annie, paid for the flags. So thank you for, for doing that. <clears throat> we could not afford them, by the way. So some of the board members chipped in, and, and Tom's mother um, took leadership in, in helping us fund them. So the Columbus um, Convention Bureau would not allow us to put the flags. They got a lot of flack. So the phones were buzzing crazy. Nobody wanted the flags. So many of us wanted them. So what we did was we decided to install them on a Saturday. So they allowed us to do that. So I can tell you the names. Michael Council, Don Love Firstweiler. Many of us followed the truck. And many of us cried because he was really telling the city, we're here, we're queer, and we're not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> And, and that, that, was, that was a special moment, I think, for Stonewall and, and for all of us. It, was, it seemed so weird, but following that truck, watching those flags go up, um, it was covered by the news, but it, it was really about taking leadership and, and telling the world that we were here. I also want to salute Stonewall because during the HIV crisis, they were critical, and it really speaks to the value of partnerships. And again, my training is in public health, and in public health, you never do anything alone because you usually don't have the money. So we depend on partners 
to, to build um, bridges and get the work done. So we did the same thing in Stonewall. Um, Stonewall was a safe place to come and get tested for HIV, so we planted testers there so that people felt comfortable doing that. We had support groups. Um, we had a group of lesbians that would donate blood for people living with HIV. And I cannot say enough about the lesbian community. You know, when, when HIV broke, um, many gay men were not able to, to do what they wanted to do because they were afraid. And the lesbian community had no fear. Um, they came out, they came out like nothing I'd ever seen before. And actually women in general did. Um, so I, I, I wanna make sure that, that, that we acknowledge that work and, and how safe Stonewall was for, for the community. I also wanna chat a little bit about the power of collaborations and I'll tell you, I don't see that many collaborations, as many as I would like to see today as we did then. We have to go back to collaborating and getting together. I learned that from ACT UP. You know, ACT UP would protest in front of the building, but they com would come in behind the building and sit down with the health commissioner and work on stuff. So it's not only about acting up in front of the building, it's really about going in through the back door and doing the work, getting the work done. Um, and ACT UP taught me that. Um, so we had a lot of collaborations. I remember the days in which the bar owners would get together, Leanne, on a regular basis. Unheard of today. Keep in mind the bars were a center of where we could gather. The coffee table, I see Julie Applegate, who was our star at the coffee table. Um, you could go to the coffee table in the short north and there was a sense of community that you could go there and that was a safe place. The same thing for the bars. The bars owners don't talk to each other today. But I remember Alice and Todd and all those great people having regular meetings. Um, doesn't happen anymore. Um, so I, I miss those days and I'm probably going on too long. But um, I don't think there's any time, so I think it's okay. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, I, I do want to say two more things about Stonewall that, that were critical. In that case, in that, in that case, <laughs> um, well, you're talking about really important things, so I think it's also you. important to bring it up. Yeah. Thank you. So when I was a younger man um, and I was new to Columbus, I didn't know who to go to. And I wanted to support my community. So there was something called um, Stonewall News. It was a publication prior to Outlook, which I owned for about three minutes along with, um, along with Lynn Greer. Um, but it was, um, Stonewall News was the way we connected with each other as well. So it came out monthly. Um, and that was extremely powerful. It was before the internet, the dark ages. Um, but it published about 12 to 15,000. So it was our way of staying connected together. And Stonewall gave us that. The other piece that Stonewall gave us, and I'm gonna do a plug for them because I love them, it's the lavender listings. That was the way where I got my dentist. That's who, if I wanted my deck cleaned, that's where I would go to. My insurance agent is still from the Lavender listings. Um, so it was a play of, place of, for giving back to our community and supporting people like yourselves. So there was also a lot of allies on the Lavender listings, by the way. You allies, don't be afraid of advertising. We wanna do business with you. But those two things were critical in the 90s of, um, of how we, we communicated and, and loved each other and supported each other and the lavender list is, listings are still alive and well, so. I think you're hearing a lot of very personal stories about you know, the advocates, the allies, who were there for individuals. One of the things Steve Schellerbarger, I remember him saying is that you know, a lot of times, myself included, I was given an opportunity to come out. I created my, my own plan. And you know, coming out as, as, as any uh, member of this alphabet is the most important thing we can do but one thing Steve said was the AIDS crisis forced us to come out. And people were not prepared for what that would mean to friendships, to their doctors, to their clergy, to anyone who was in their, their nuclear circles. And so 
staying on the theme of allyship, I'm curious, Leanne, you played a big role in Stonewall's. Um, I have a pen on my, my, my lapel here from 1991. You served on Stonewall's board after that. Yeah. But speak to other allyships in that next um, decade. Well, <laughs> let's see. I was on the board in, uh, from 97 through 99. So I think that at that time, the allyship, what, what was happening with Stonewall at that time, and what I've appreciated has happened since then, is they really were focused also on educating the community on things that were changing. And we would meet at Stonewall and they would put on, you know, excuse me, group, you know, group meetings and we would talk about things and they would ask those of us who might be in certain situations to come and talk. And this is particularly as I'm talking about before marriage equality. When families, you know, it, it struck me that that Denzel said, we Denzel said, we just want to be happy. And that's true. Families just want, you know, we, we pick our families, right? I mean, most of us do. We create our own families. And it, they were very, Stonewall was very instrumental in allowing us to explore that through different kinds of conversations. And so the allies, one of the things we did was we actually started to educate the court. And, you know, Carol Fay and I were probably two of the rebels at the court that people would see us coming and they would just kind of put their head down, you know. <laughs> um, and, but what we did was we explained there are more families out there who want to be recognized and who need to be recognized and you have an opportunity to recognize them. They can't be married, but they should be able to have legal agreements that recognize their family and respect their family. And so there was starting to be a collaboration between the enlightened uh, judges in our court system uh, that would listen and actually come and present themselves at, present on topics themselves at Stonewall. And that was very critical. Uh, and I think that one of the things we became very proud of was what I like to call in my practice creative family creations, you know, um, because it doesn't have to be the, the nuclear family that we're all familiar with. Um, and we went from shared custody agreements with Carol, which Carol started. We went from shared custody agreements, that went all the way up to, most people don't know this, that concept went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that was a contract between two people about a child, and that's legit. So then we knew we had a springboard, you know? And, and so then, I mean, I've done, this court, Franklin County has been amazing. I've had some horrific experiences in other counties where I've actually had a judge say to me when we were litigating uh, two women that had raised this child, the one woman that birthed the child then married a man and he became the stepfather. And I had a judge say to me, well, we've got this hu husband and wife over here who have a child and then we've got this other thing. And uh, so I sat on my hands and I listened and I, you know, I mean, that, that's what was happening. Whoa, even 10 years ago, you know? And, and Stonewall has helped us with these um, presentations and people coming and asking questions and, and the members and the allies educating us so that we could continue to help educate the court. Um, Franklin County's court, in, at least in domestic and ju juvenile, is amazing. Our judges are just amazing. I'm going to ask a question of Denzel, and then I would love uh, anyone in the audience to slowly make your way to the microphones, and we'll get ready for some audience Q&A. Um, Denzel, you and I have talked a lot about uh, this is such a great moment to improve upon Stonewall's history. And you are, I believe, very deeply the right person at the right time. Talk a little bit about what lessons you think Stonewall has had to learn, has chosen to learn, and how you plan to carry that forward. Uh, thank you both <laughs> for what you said. You know, so I, I'm, I'm a note taker and I'm always connecting dots. I think the, what we've heard um, hopefully has been sort of first how as an organization we've continued to and have made space um, and making space is essential uh, for so many things. We've heard about how bars 
were spaces for gathering. Um, we've heard about how the, the physical or organizational space of coming together around the HIV AIDS crisis was important. Um, and I think what, what Stonewall has done and will continue to do is sort of ensure that there's space made uh, for these critical issues in our time. But I think what we've also seen is that we respond in time to what the community needs in that moment. And I think that's gonna be something that we will continue to do, right? Um, as our community has needed something, we have been the nexus of that creation that has spawned something else. So as we talk about organizations like Bravo and Equality Ohio, Equitas, formerly ARC, um, Stonewall has been at the nexus of the creation of these organizations, for good or bad. Um, we have we have been enabled our community to respond to what we need, and I think that's something we will continue to do. And I think the lesson that uh, that I've learned uh, growing up as a child in the 80s, um, uh, learning and, and reading about organizations like ACT UP, um, I'm reading a phenomenal book right now uh, called Let the Record Show, um, so I would recommend it to anyone. Uh, who, well, I just recommend to anyone. Uh, it's, it is 600 plus pages, so if you've got time, uh, hopefully you can do it. Um, but Let the Record Show is really a study in, in organizing. Um, it's a reflection on how ACT UP as a group um, was able to come together but still be independent in its mission and, 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 and its work uh, leading toward one thing, right? Saving lives. Um, and here you had all of these subgroups within ACT UP still working towards a mission of saving lives, but doing that work differently and responding to what the community needed in that moment, in that way, in that time. And so I think what we, what we learn from, from that moment and what we are seeing actually quite now in our existence um, is that organizations will continue to pop up um, to, to create what those intersectional communities need to be supported. Um, but there should be a space where we can all come together, um, where we can all find unity and comfort and safety in that space um, where you should be supported with whatever ideas that you want to generate in support of helping us all find happiness in our community. And so I think that's a lesson that we've taken um, as a child of the 80s, as, as someone who um, had a parent who died from HIV AIDS or complications thereof, um, as, as, as an individual who didn't think that they'd be sitting here on this stage, right? As a black person, as a queer black person who has been told that they shouldn't or shouldn't be in these spaces. Um, there are a lot of lessons that I have that hopefully I will be able to impart in the community um, and help uh, others find their happiness. And so I think as, as I'm helping guide the organization of Stonewall, um, those are lessons that I have, hopefully lessons that I'll be able to impart to the team that we work with, um, but also to the community that we serve. Um, and hopefully the volunteers that will come along and, and help us get that work done. Um, you know, I think uh, we, we have a really rich and storied history here in Columbus, uh, in central Ohio. Um, we've inspired a lot. We've been inspired by a lot, um, and uh, I'm just excited about what the next 40 years will be like. Jane, do you have something? I'm sorry to interrupt you there. <laughs> That's okay. Um, there are some questions, and anyone who is in the audience, please come up because we're going to be switching back and forth. And Megan, feel free to jump in with questions as well. Um, Maybe you could just review for all of us the major impact, the changes that perhaps would not have happened if Stonewall was never founded. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a, quite frankly a big question, and I think if you don't see the impact, that's sort of um, shocking. So when we first think about it, so Stonewall itself, the organization was founded um, when the Reverend Jerry Falwell was coming to town um, and uh, doing the majority, uh, moral majority um, push. And so if we had no organization or Stonewall Union at that time, we could only imagine what the community would have heard. They would have heard one side of an argument um, and then think about what would have come out of that. Um, when we think about the elected officials that we've had uh, in our, in our uh, offices here in, in our community, Stonewall Union used to be a 501c4 organization, and so we were actually active in, in lobbying and pushing and encouraging um, elected officials uh, or fair-minded officials to, to be running down ballot or on the ballot. Um, and so when we think about um, even the fact that Columbus was one of the first cities uh, to pass uh, an ordinance in protection for LGBTQ community members, that was Stonewall's work. Um, when we think about Columbus Pride and, and, and the way that we come together as a community every June, um, that was Stonewall Columbus's work. So I think 
um, to me, there are really significant moments in our history, uh, in our Columbus history, that we can turn to Stonewall for um, uh, recognition. Um, but then there are many probably small moments that we just aren't thinking about, um, as we talked about flags on, on uh, down, down High Street. Uh, City Hall now lights up uh, rainbow. Um, Bravo as an organization. So again, we think about uh, these spaces. I think, again, we, we're at the nexus of a lot. Why don't you finish that out? Yeah, so uh, one, one great example would be Bravo, the, the Boca Region Anti-Violence Project, which is now held at Equitas, but it had its roots on a safety um, group that started their work in at, at Stonewall Union. And keep in mind that we as queer people, especially trans folks and trans folks of color, are um, impacted by, by violence in a unique ways, in ways that, that most other communities are not. So having an anti-violence project started at Stonewall was critical. And the fact that that work continues today continues to be a, of extreme importance. So, I'm really proud of that work that got started by Stonewall. I was going to mention Equality Ohio, the, the current incarnation. You know, there are a lot of positive offshoots. Yes, absolutely. Certainly. Um, I think that one, but for Stonewall, it's so hard to even try and come up with what that will look like. But you know, anytime you open up the papers, you look at the press, there's still a lot to do and it's easy to become disheartened by looking at the printed materials the quotes coming out of the state legislature right now that's really one of the reasons why i'm here um, as auditor i care deeply about the cost of inequality it will set the state of ohio back uh, but free very very sincerely let us just be very hyper vigilant to to this and what it is doing to our economy as a state right now but I'm here before, you know, as an elected official because, frankly, everyone else before me, I'm acutely aware I am no smarter than a lot of the individuals who have tried to run for office before. I am no better as anyone else. In fact, there have been especially some judicial candidates we were talking about before who should now be on the Supreme Court because of their legal acumen. But it just so happened their names ended with comma lesbian. And I talk about that a lot because never, to the best of my knowledge, has my name ever had Megan Kilgore, comma, lesbian. And that is something to especially Tom and Jeannie, I can see that emotionally affecting you. I understand that, I recognize that, but until we have statewide protections, we can't stop. It feels okay here in Columbus, but we have a lot, of more, a lot more work to do. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, Jeff Redfield, a uh, member of the community since I moved here in 94, but even before that, when I lived in Dayton, would come over and became part of the community here. And just to echo some of the things, the, the one thing that for me Stonewall was about gathering and meeting, where you could find your community, whether whatever it might be, that led to a lot of other engagements. Um, proud member of the sports community here. <laughs> the challenges that we faced at that time to find your like people that's what stonewall provided and the, the it's you how do you talk about the history without talking about the support um stonewall was there in supporting the sports groups when they formed when we hosted the first gay sports national competition here at the north american gay volleyball association in 98 to this summer 11 million dollar impact by the Gay Softball World Series here. The largest gay softball event in the history of the world. But what I reflect back on often was the Matthew Shepard crisis. And I say crisis because so much was going on and this is what worries me still as we go forward. At the same time Matthew was murdered, there were so many other people that were not in the news. Black, African-American, transgender. This has been going on for so long. And I've always said a thing about our community is that we are a microcosm of the society as a whole. All the isms within the general society are within our LGBTQ community as well. 
how do, do we look at our history and go forward to change this? We're seeing it now in the news. There's a highlight on a social media situation. Others are missing, but nobody's paying attention to that. So how do we look beyond our issues and go forward in the next 40 years of Stonewall? Thanks. Say that Jeff was the sixth executive director of Stonewall, so thank you for your service, Jeff. Thing. Good. Number six, which I love. Uh, you know, and uh, Jeff, you know, I, I appreciate uh, sort of the place where you put that time frame for me when you mentioned Matthew Shepard, um, because it's something I remember every year on my birthday. Uh, so Matthew was pronounced dead on my birthday. I was uh, in college, about to turn 21. Uh, I think it was October 17th or 16th when I heard uh, the news of Matthew Shepard being beaten to death. Uh, and or beaten to the near death and left, right? And um, here I was uh, uh, at Kenyon College, small little liberal arts college north of here, uh, pretty white, it was at the time. Uh, and, and I remember being, uh, I used to always say I felt like a raisin in a bowl of cream of wheat there, but I remember at this moment feeling so much, the intention being certainly heightened, right? Because I was pretty out on campus. I was fairly out on campus. But I also remember being so angry because of something that you just mentioned, that I had known there were other people, black, brown, indigenous people, who had been murdered, who had been killed the same way, and no one spoke of them. Um, and so I was torn, right? Because again, I'm turning 21, I should be happy and excited because that's a fun time. Um, I'm also out and, and, and proud of who I am, but also really angry that why is he getting so much more attention than the other people, people like me? Um, who have not gotten such attention. I, I think what we have to remember is that uh, our community is representative of those in leadership, oftentimes, right? So when you don't have leaders who are intersectional, who represent the populations of the community that are most in need of support, sometimes people forget, right, that they need to turn the attention to those populations the most. So I would hope that at least during my time uh, in Stonewall's, uh, as exec executive director of Stonewall, that my intersectional identity will help ensure that we're not stepping away from the, the populations and people that need our support the most. It is important that we recognize and, and support everyone in our community, right, because there are people who came before me who set, as my team says, the stones uh, for us to get here. They set the bricks and, and we are now stepping on their backs, their pavements, whatever they've built for us. And so I'm thankful for the communities who at the time were, were the ones we turned our attention to the most, but now it's time for us to turn our attention to the communities who need it as well the most. And we will, we will, at least while I'm sitting in this seat. Um, and I hope that whatever legacy that is stays with the organization after I'm gone. Right, that we understand the most important work is to support those who are most in need of supporting. I hope that stays. Wow. Great response. Jane? So I'm gonna ask both of these questions together because I think they can have some of the same answer. Bill Lafayette, my perception is that threats to our progress are increasing. Do you share that concern? And if so, how can we as a community preserve the progress that we have made? And then Steve Swift asks, what does Stonewall Columbus do better in representing the LGBTQ plus community that maybe other cities in the, than any other cities in the US? And, and how does Stonewall work with other cities? So progress and collaboration. I, I think they're, I actually think they're different questions. So I'm gonna disconnect them if you don't mind. Um, so I think the first question really is passage of the Equality Act. That's on the federal level, right? Um, I think here locally in the state of Ohio, we also have a, a bill that we need to pass. I can't remember the number of it, <laughs> what, what, the, what number that bill is. But uh, I mean, ultimately in our state, um, queer identities are, can still be prosecuted in so many different ways, right? Um, you can still get married and then the next day have someone fire you here in this state. These things are not okay. And I think on the federal level, if we don't have passage of, of the Equality Act, we're gonna still continue to see that. Small changes, right, take time, and I think legislative changes, legal changes at the top will make the biggest and swiftest changes moving down the pike. So I think that's the first thing. Um, is passed with the Equality Act at the national, federal level, but then also thinking about what we can do here at the state level to bolster those protections. Um, I, you know, I think the, the future is singularly collaboration. 
Um, I've, I've been privileged enough to travel the country um, for former jobs, um, for my own passion and interests, um, and I've been able to visit you know, a lot of the other cities that have LGBTQ centers in, in, our, in, 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 the, in the state, or excuse me, in the country. Um, and I love to aspire. There's no reason to not aspire. And when I think of uh, the LA Center and the work that they do, um, I want to aspire to that. Um, when I think of New, New, the New York Center and the work that they do, I want to aspire to that. We are the 14th largest city in the country. 14th largest city in the country. And I think that we have an opportunity to ensure um, that our LGBTQ community is represented in that 14th largest city population. Um, that diversity is there, we can support it, um, and I see other cities that have done that. So that is the hope for the future, is that through collaboration uh, and partnership, we will be representative of what the 14th largest city in the country should be doing when it comes to LGBTQ equality and community work. I would like to turn the microphone to Lorda Sparosa de Padilla for one last question. Okay, um, so, um, I have many thoughts and trying to put them all together, but something that Jose said uh, struck me because I think that in the movement towards equality, and this happens in, in, in different communities, right? We reach like this level and we think like we made it. And obviously we, I mean, we don't clearly, right? There's like a next level and a ne another iteration, right? And I think, especially when you were talking about like partnerships and coming together and coalescing around things, the um, the moment in time necessitates that, right? Necessitates that we all go in. And so my question is, you know, as I look at my kids where they are, it, um, you know, where they correct me on pronouns and mommy, she's fluid and I don't know what I like and I don't like labels, they're 11 and 13, so watch out world. So um, when, when I look at that and I look at our future, right? And I think about what is the next level of the movement one? next parts of the movement, and I mean, that seems like an obvious question, but I know that there's, it's not. Um, and secondly, what can allies do to really lean in, and how can we be better? How can we show up better? How can we be better advocates of the movement? Thank you, can I start? <clears throat> so I think what, one of the things, Lourdes, it's great to see you, by the way. One of the things that we need to do is continue to elect policy makers that value what we value. So, and I, and I, <clears throat> I don't say that just because Lourdes is, is running and asking the question, but if you look at the medical practitioner conscious clause in the budget that was recently passed, that is a license to discriminate. The fact that I can go to a physician and the physician thinks that I may be gay, lesbian, trans, whatever, however I choose to identify, and they have a license in our state to discriminate against me, should be criminal. So the work for the next 40 years, then so. It's a minefield, just when we think that we, here we are celebrating progress. I get emotional talking about it. The fact that we're celebrating progress, and yet we just took like 20 years worth of work backwards. Um, I salute my colleagues at Equitas for their, for their work in, in advocacy because we're not done. Your work is not done, your work is not done. We got a lot of work to do. So continuing to elect um, policy makers, I think that, that value diversity and, and really human decency. We're, we're not asking for much, folks. We're just asking for equality. I'm not asking for anything special. I'm just asking that if I go to a physician, I get treated. Not much, I mean, it doesn't get any more decent than that. So, sorry for the emotion, but. That's a splendid way to end our luncheon today. Uh, on behalf of the panelists, I thank you so very much for your time, and I thank you deeply for everything that you panelists have done to date and will continue to do. And there are a lot of people in this room, Jeff, you're not aware of this, but the woman who brought the Columbus uh, to Columbus, the Gay Softball World Series, is Linda Logan. And believe it or not, we beat out San Francisco for that event. Yes, that's true. That's absolutely true. You are the champions, and you are our, um, we're relying upon you. In your morning commutes, consider that just between certain subdivisions, the, uh, the protections are not equal. Just think about that every time you drive to work right now. And please do your best to to continue to advance 
uh, for, for every reason that we've discussed today. Thank you all very much for being here. Thanks once again to Megan and thanks to our panelists. If I can just indulge you for a minute, uh, being a longtime member of this community, I'm 57 years old, so um, I just wanted to offer a couple of my own reflections, and I promise this won't take very long. But, you know, when I, I started college in 1982, and my first class in my first quarter was Psychology 101, and there was a chapter in the Psychology 101 book that listed sexual deviancies, and it included pedophilia, rapists, uh, a lot of other things, and homosexuals. And uh, I remember our psych professor saying, well, this American Psychological Association is starting to think di differently, so we're not going to cover that section. But it was still in black and white, and it was still in my college textbook. Uh, the first gay bars I ever went to, and it wasn't to drink, it was, uh, as, as others here have said, is because it was the one place we could go for community. Not one of them had a sign. They had small windows, literally like you see on cartoons. Open the window, see if you're okay, close the window, let you in, and decide if you want in. Police still raided gay bars. I was in gay bars many times when police came in for no other reason than her to harass. There was always some supposed reason, you know, illegal drinking or drugs or whatever, but that's not what it was about. They, 20 police officers would come in, line up every person in the bar, search every one of you, ask you who you were, and then let you potentially go out the door. Uh, people who were drag performers, when, before they got in their cars to go home, they put on two pairs of men's socks. Why? Because in Columbus, it was illegal for a man to wear women's clothing, uh, and you had to have on at least two items of men's clothing to prevent yourself from being arrested going home. Uh, the first gay pride parades, the protesters numbered as many people as the people who marched. I can remember coming around the corner and having thousands and thousands of supposed Christians standing in front of the State House, and I will never forget uh, the evil, terrible things they shouted, and two signs in particular. One, keep in mind, this was the height of the AIDS epidemic. One of them that said, God will turn you fruits and nuts into vegetables. And the other one that said, God hates fags. These are the things I remember as, as a young gay person coming out. We used, in later years, when the gay pride parades had tens of thousands of attendees, the local newspaper, the dispatch, not proud to say, the headline would be hundreds of people marched in the gay pride yes, parade yesterday. It was 50, 60, 70,000. They would pick the most outrageous picture of a bare-breasted uh, lesbian on a, on a motorcycle or a drag queen doing some outrageous thing instead of the people who were actually there advocating f to, to take us forward. Um, when I asked my boss, I worked for a Wall Street firm for many years, you know, what it would take for me to get promoted, his response was, you know, Tom, I think behind every good man is a good woman. That was a very clear message to me. Um, Jose talked about the flags that went up. I too cried when I saw flags going up because I never thought that we were gonna see that in our lifetime. Marriage equality is not about special rights. Uh, my husband, who is far healthier than me, had a heart attack right before marriage equality, and the hospital wasn't so sure they were going to go let me go back to see him in the cath lab because I had no legal status with him. This is not about special rights. We are not done yet. Discrimination is, as, as Denzel said, is completely legal, and Jose said, is completely legal in Ohio in its many, many forms. Housing, employment, uh, provision of services, totally legal, totally legal. You could have a flat tire on a country road and pull into a garage to get it fixed, and that person can say, get away from me, you're a homosexual. Those things are all legal. We are not done yet. Um, I happen to be the organist at several Catholic churches. I have been reported time and time and time again to the Catholic Bishop of Columbus for being unworthy to volunteer my time and services to play uh, the organ at a Catholic church solely because of the fact that I'm gay. Organizations like Stonewall have been so critically important in moving the needle forward. We have so far to go. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you because um, uh, we live it every day. So thank you for listening to my little uh, comments here. Um, I hope you found today's forum enlightening, interesting, 
um, and um, I hope that it gave you a, a perspective on the things that we still need to get done. Please join us next Wednesday as CMC presents Colorization, 100 Years of Black Films in a White World with author Will Haygood and other special guests. I'd also like to once again thanks today's forum sponsors, AARP Ohio and Ulmer and Byrne, and today's partner, PFLAG Columbus. Also thanks to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. And of course, thank you for our online virtual seat patrons who joined us virtually today. And once again, thank you very much. Special appreciation to our speakers, Leanne Masucci, Denzel Porteous, Jose Rodriguez, and our fabulous host, Megan Kilgore. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's Lynn Greer Legacy and Civic Engagement Forum. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Have a great day.